Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Heights Baptist Church. If you would all stand with me and take your hymnals, we'll sing page 320. Page 320, I will praise him. Good to see everybody here this morning. It's great to be back. Back home. Page 320 in your hymnals, we'll sing I will praise him. When I saw the cleansing fountain, all together sing it out now. When I saw the cleansing fountain, open wide for all my sin. Sing the third verse. Then God's fire upon the altar of my heart was set aflame. I shall never cease to praise Him. Glory, glory to Him. Sing it out on the chorus. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. the last verse. Please remain standing for the scripture reading. Well, one more week, we hope and pray the Curleys will be back uh, with us after they get a clean test result. But turning the Bibles to John chapter 9, John chapter 9, we'll be reading together verse 4, 5, and 6. John chapter 9, verse 4 through 6. Are you that year, there yet, Miss Andrea? Yes, sir. Okay, John chapter 9, verse 4 through 6, all together as we read. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh, with no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Amen. Good to see Brother Colt and his family back with us safely. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you today and we just want to say, Father, we love you. Not only because you first loved us, but we love you because of what you've done for us, which has given us eternal life and salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. No greater gift than that can ever be given. Father, help us to be mindful of that, not to abuse your love, not to take it lightly, but always and forever be 
doing things and saying things that will bring you glory and honor and serving you by faith. Thank you, Father, for your blessings upon our church and how you've met our needs down through the years. And Lord, we just give you the thanks and the praise for that. Thank you for the visitors here today, Lord. We love to see them when they come and help them, Father, while they're here to be made felt welcome and that you would bless them through your word. Bless those, Father, who cannot be with us today because they're in hospitals or homesick, recovering. Just give them grace and strength and peace and mercy today, Father, and meet their every need according to your grace and according to your riches and glory. We pray especially, Father, for the preaching of your word today. When a world is so full of lies and half-truths and accusations and hatred, we need to hear from you, Father, that you might encourage us in our faith to walk closer to you every day, to assemble together as we see that day approaching, as you told us in your word. We might be a faithful people, a useful people, serving out of love and concern and faith and just doing your will. We ask, Father, that you'd help us do it through the power of your word and through the Holy Spirit within us. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Take your hymnals again. Turn to page 411. Page 411. Oh, how I love Jesus. Page 411. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses. Page 411. There is a name. I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because On the last, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Amen. This time the choir will continue that theme this morning. All that throws my soul is Jesus.
if you would all stand with me again, take your hymnals. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> page 404, page 404. Jesus is all the world to me. We should strive for that every day, that Jesus is the whole world to us. Living for Jesus, page 404. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses again. Page 404 on that first verse. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, and my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go, no other Let's speed it up just a little bit on that second verse all together. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend and trial soul. I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and more. He sends a sunshine on the last. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Beautiful life with such a wonderful friend the stick is closer than a brother amen father of heaven we thank you for our time together this time to come together and worship you in spirit and in truth lord we desire to be your people we want to be faithful to you not only for this day but all of our days and we pray that you'd help us to be mindful of some gravely important things this day and lord the things that we're going to be needful in our own life if we're going to persevere as we should so give us what we need this day, and we will leave here, the sacred place, we'll, we'll be able to say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, and thank you, Lord, for making me whole. So bless us now as we give, in Jesus' name, amen.
so long you were right when I was wrong I can't repay all the love you've given me you were my friend when no one cared I felt alone but you were there thing that's ever happened to me and I owe it all to you Lord all I have is yours Lord take my life make me what you'd have me be that's ever happened to me borrowed treasures borrowed dreams all life's joys you've given me when troubles come you're always there to make me smile let come what may thy will be done i love you jesus god's only son lord you're the best thing that's ever happened to that's ever happened to me and i owe it all to you lord all i have is yours lord take my life make me what you'd have me be ever happened to me I'm your child and you're my father I'm the clay and you're the potter Lord you're the best thing that's ever happened to me turn your bibles if you would to jude last week i started the morning message with proof of the virtue of our nation especially in the establishment of our nation's top institutions as learning is that they believed in the supremacy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ above all learning. Is that same virtue that the father of this nation, George Washington, felt was absolutely unattainable without religion playing a prominent role in the lives of the hearts, minds, and the people of these United States. He also felt that without such virtue that is only gained from religious pursuit, the spiritual influence, that without it there would be no virtue and there would be no hope for the nation. Amen. Be no nation at all, just a matter of time. Because the lack of oversight the things of God, America's first leading institutions, instead of continuing to be a beacon of shining light 
became a magnet for spiritual darkness even unto this day. They've helped lead this nation to an abounding apostasy in our land. The elites of our land are apostate. The reason I say they offered to help lead is because the Bible correctly tells us judgment begins in the house of God. Without question, Christianity played though a major role in the establishment of our nation. Whereas the founding fathers called for Christian virtue. Now in the halls of Congress, the streets of our cities, the communists, the atheists, the secularists, the socialists, the sexual perverts call for their agenda instead. It's not a stretch to say today that there is an abounding apostasy in our land. Abounding apostasy. And no one knows that better than the elders of our land who fear God and seek to keep His commandments. Much like the nation of Israel when they were brought into the land and flowing with milk and honey, they then turned their backs on Almighty God and started serving strange gods, worshiping strange gods, which the Apostle Paul calls demons in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Many of the professors of God, those who pay lip service to God these days, have turned their backs on God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are indeed serving a strange God. Millions of people are at church this morning, but a great portion of those are apostates. They've turned their back on the Lord our God. They've turned their back on the true Lord Jesus Christ and His teaching. This is nowhere now more illustrated than the many Christian denominations who advocate for sodomy, sexual perversion as a norm, as a respectable activity when God clearly calls it an abomination. They have joined themselves to Rome in a culture that was clearly apostate in the kingdom. Romans chapter 1 has never been so applicable as it is today in our nation. We turn back the clock now some 2,000 years, we find the same thing was going on back in that time as recorded for us now in the book of Jude. The apostle Peter, of course, he warns of the falling away of apostasy and easily by the time of Jude's writing, it had already found its way into Christianity and will continue in verse 1 of Jude. The servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend, fight for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness, a long word meaning wickedness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The preacher's warning that God will punish wicked perverters of his word, that he will punish them. And there will be no exception, no exception to this. God will punish the wicked. It may take time. It may even take a long time. The day is the Lord as a thousand years. But as sure as there's a sun and a moon, it will happen. God will judge wickedness. It's coming. The preacher, of course, then gives some examples for them to do well and as a reminder, if you would, not to tempt the wrath of God. Our God is a holy God, a just God. Verse 5, he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, something they're very familiar with, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now though the illustration here is given about the fallen angels, the warning is to people. People are always trying to blame somebody else and you find historically people even tried to blame the angels for the problems of humanity. Verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, all kinds of 
wrongful sexual sins and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. And what they know naturally as brute beast in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves with, uh, without fear. Clouds they are without water. In other words, their messages seem to have good content, but all it is at the end is hot air, no substance, no rain. Carried about of winds, unreliable, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also on the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. We would also call that leverage these days. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves central, having not the Spirit. In other words, they are not Christian at all. The world pretends there is no God. They pretend there is no God and that the God of heaven will not judge the wicked. They're wrong. And history throughout ancient times proves that they are wrong. And that their sin will find them out in due time. The great lie of Lucifer, the great lie of Satan is there's no consequence for sin. There's no payday for sin. Satan told Eve in the garden, recorded for us in Genesis 3, He shall not surely die. When God said of a truth, You eat of this fruit and thou shalt die. Satan come along, slithering along, he says, Thou shalt not die. Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So what do the religions of the world tell us today? Mormonism, what does it teach? Thou shalt not die. Huh, interesting. Satan's message, thou shalt not die. The Bible says to the point of the man who wants to die. And after this, the judgment. Reincarnation, thou shalt not die. False gods of Egypt, thou shalt not die. That's why they buried ships in the graves. Atheism, you will not die because you never really spiritually lived. But God has given a warning. A warning still rings out across our land. The day you eat of the forbidden fruit, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Satan comes along and he presents to Eve just the opposite. You shall not surely die. Yea, hath God said. Questioning God's word. Questioning God's promise to death to sinners. It's a lifelong favorite of Satan. You shall not die. God is a just God. He is the only God and is a just God. He says that he will punish wickedness. He will punish those human beings who disregard his word 
and act as if there's no righteous God above all to whom we have to do. Verse 20 on turns and goes to, from the woe to sinners to the wonder of God for the saints and the great provisions to Almighty God. And I'll tell you whose side I want to be on. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy, holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some having compassion, making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. What happened to Christians like that? What happened to Christians like that? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling... And to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. How do we escape? Well, there's only one way. By finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. This good servant Jude wanted and intended to write the people about their mutual faith in Lord Jesus Christ and encourage them and have a good positive message for them, an uplifting message. But he had a bunch of crooks in the land, had a bunch of false teachers in the land, apostates, and they were wrecking the lives of God's people. And they're doing so from within. And so he's compelled by the Holy Spirit of God to speak and take an ax to the tree. That's more of what we need today. He wants the saints delivered from such woe. And any good man, any good woman, any good preacher wants God people, God's people delivered from such woe. Last week I noted the identification of three things are stressed about these ungodly men. A, they crept in to the people of God unaware. They didn't make themselves aware that we're here to do great damage. That they turned from the grace of God and made the grace of God. They abused the grace of God and turned it in all kinds of wickedness. And of course they denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Looked at their association and here Jude identifies false teachers. It's the same group of type of people as Peter described. And the list provided is letter A, Israel. Many Jews were in the nation yet destroyed because of their sin. So much for national salvation. Two fallen angels, more of that. C. Sodom and Gomorrah. D. Satan with Michael. The great angel of the Lord, Cain, without a proper blood sacrifice, was cast out. Balaam was all about money, money, money. Gain. And Korah, who rejected the divine authority God had given to Moses. I said Romans 1 has never been so applicable as it is today in our very nation. And we are headed to Romans chapter 1. I'll get there. You just hold your horses. I promise I'll get there by God's grace. Well, let me first talk a little bit about the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, which drives the same point home of the common disaster of apostasy in the land. It's a sister text and of course provides a list of examples as well. The Apostle Peter warned, as did Jude, in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Are you there? Say amen. amen. But there were false prophets also among the people, as, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many, broad is the way, many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Well, you're just a bunch of narrow bigots. You claim Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. And through covetous, covetousness shall they with feign insincere put on words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Pretty strong words, right? Peter's examples, what does he lay out? Letter A, fallen angels. Letter B, the old world, the pre-flood era, the old world. Letter C, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, 
a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now Jude and 2 Peter here are the only texts in the New Testament which explain to us a passage in the Old Testament. And that takes us back to Genesis chapter 6. Both Peter and Jude use the occasion which was well known to the, to the Jews, Genesis 6, to be the common knowledge which is yet the same common knowledge today of religious Jews even to this day in 2022. They still believe what I'm going to tell you. They still believe it. Common knowledge. And it was all there to warn them of the growing apostasy in the land. And the readers or listeners would be familiar with the stories, the examples that were given them. What use is a story that doesn't make any sense to them? No, it's something they knew very well. It's something they were already teaching to their own children. We know God created man, then woman from man, and God gave them his word. Satan comes along and questions the word of God, tempting them, and Eve sins, then Adam. And they're both cast out of the, the garden. The world into sin by Adam's sin. Some 1,650 years later. 1,650 years later. Things have gotten so bad, so wicked, so perverted. That the fallen angels of our Lord get into the game with fallen mankind. And all the world was corrupt before God except eight people. You know, after a new start again, we see mankind trying to do their own thing again towards God. They build a great tower, the Tower of Babel. Another man-made religion trying to be as God. Trying to be as the divine and thou shalt never die. Interesting. You will be like God. Isn't that what Satan said in the garden? Same old damnable lie. Again, believers were thinking there. There are no consequences for their sin. And they were wrong. They were those who paid lip service to God. My point is that there's always an ever increasing apostasy in the land. In Genesis chapter 6, catch me there. Verse 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, they were pretty. And that they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. It grieved God what man had become. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And then those wonderful words. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jude is particular and helpful in sorting this all out. 
In verse 6, As the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. We know years and years ago, Satan was cast out and he drew one third of the holy angels with him and they were cast out of heaven. They were not cast to hell. Satan is a roaring lion walking to and fro. Where? On earth. On earth. Satan and their rebellion at that time was all against God. It was all in the spiritual realm. This was also a great rebellion of the, the fallen angels. But this time it involved humanity. Adam and Eve and the descendants of mankind created in the image of Almighty God. We see their action involved sexual perversion. Sexual perversion. As verse 7 connects the example to that grave error. When it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. So in like fashion, giving themselves over to fornication, not only fornication, but giving themselves to sexual deviance and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That doesn't really sound to me like people who are given to such belong to God. I said it just doesn't sound to me just like Paul said people who are given to such belong to God even if they have a church so designated for their people. The great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not only fornication, but excessive fornication. And beyond that, which Romans 1 also reflects. And that is perverted sexual activity. Perverted sexual activity. A perversion, if you would, of the normal sexual attraction between a man and a woman. So abnormal, unnatural activities for even a natural man and a natural man in God's Word is a lost man. It's unnatural even for a natural lost man to contemplate and do such abominable acts. So listed are the actions of the sons of God. Now the term sons of God is used here to refer to is the direct creation of God. Sons of God. Sons of God. God created angels, did he not? All angels were created by God. All of them. A third later, of course, fell in the rebellion with Satan, their leader. All uses of the term sons of God or of the Almighty indicate angels and humans, not in the Old Testament. All of them. Starting with the oldest book in the Bible in Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, angels. Job 2, 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Obviously, angels. In Job chapter 38, verse 4. Where was thou? This is, you know, Mr. Job had become Mr. Big Bridges and God was putting him in his place. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Hast thou laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? And who uh, hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What's going on? Well, God is rebuking Mr. Big Bridges. Job, where were you when I created all that is? Well, the answer to that is, well, you were nowhere, son. You were not here. But the sons of God were. 
and they shouted for joy. In all three cases, they're clearly angels. Oldest book of the Bible. Sons of God is also used, of course, in Genesis 6. Then in Daniel, when it is noted by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar that the fire of the three Hebrew children to destroy them after they were cast into the fire, he came upon the scene and what was going on? He said, wait a minute, I don't see three, I see four. And the Son of God is used here in this passage in the singular. In Daniel 3, 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Pre-incarnate Lord. Angels are also referred to as the sons of the mighty, or the mighty ones. Sons of mighty. In Psalm 89, verse 6, For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who where in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto our Lord? The mighty here are strong angels, the angels of the Lord. Psalm 103, 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength. So Psalm 89, 6, the point is, no angels can be compared to God. That's the point. Psalm 29, 29 verse 1 is an invitation for angels as well to join in the great worship of the Almighty God. Give it to the Lord, all ye mighty. Then the case is strengthened even more by the text itself in Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Sons of God. Not sons of men. Not sons of good men. Not sons of righteous men. Not sons of the righteous line of Seth. Says nothing whatsoever about anything like that. But sons of God. With daughters of men. Hardly a strong case for the line of Seth marrying the line of Cain, textually. So word studies, what do they strongly indicate? Angels. Angels. The text itself, what does it strongly indicate? Angels. By the way, Jewish thought has always been these were angels. Matter of fact, I asked a Jewish guy in Israel this very question. Who are the angels in Genesis 6? And this is what he said. Well, why do you ask? Everyone, my friend, knows this is angels. Why do you ask? Still today. Common knowledge. Common understanding of the Jews. An orthodox man. They believe these were demons, fallen angels. Early church fathers, guess what? Believe they were fallen angels. The natural reading of the text... Of course, along with the use of the sons of God, the Old Testament indicates angels, fallen angels or demons, who left their first estate the way God had ordained them to live and to operate and took the form of men as Satan took the form of a serpent. Yeah. The holy angels took the form of men in holiness with the Lord when they went into Abraham. We're having to deal with the confrontation with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says here that the sons of God, they took. That doesn't mean they raped. They just took. Took to themselves a woman in marriage. They just took, them, took their hand in marriage. Doesn't mean they raped them. It's not the language at all. They took and married daughters of men that they found pretty. Interesting. They found beautiful. Hmm. Why the pretty ones? Why not the ugly ones? Don't act like you don't know there's a difference. I hate to have to line some up, you know. Have you ever seen anyone advertise the way to remain young with all of their potions? And throw up there an ugly woman to be the model? 
put this on your face and you look like me. <laughs> no. That's not what they do, right? Right? They put a pretty one up there. Why? Do this. Buy this. Put this on your face and you'll look young forever. You will never, you will never, I heard it, die. Huh. The game that Satan plays with humanity. The sad part, it's no game. It all contributes to the lie. You shall not die. You will look like this forever. You will live forever. And that's a satanic lie. You're going against God for good. People love to follow attractive people. Have you noticed? Have you noticed? People love to follow attractive people. Find the ugliest girl in town. You won't find anybody being elected queen of the pageant, you know. No, we don't want that. We want a pretty one up there, right? Miss America, here she comes. Low and wide. No, no, man, she's got, she's got to be just right, right? That's the ones we honor. People love to follow attractive people. Saul was chosen. Why? Because he was tall and good looking. Think about it. Even, I thought about this, even the great knowledgeable prophet Samuel had to be cautioned by God even after he knew God was rejecting Mr. Tall and Good Looking from being king. And he goes to the house of Jesse and what is he impressed by? Good looks and good build. Mr. Hunkerman. And God has to remind him, hey, 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 hey. That's what got you in trouble in the first place. That's what got you in trouble in the first place. Don't be looking on the outward appearance. Look on the heart. The character of the man is the measure of a man. It's his character. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now some people say, wait a minute, preacher, wait a minute. The Bible says angels, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, our Lord, verse 30. But it says it about the angels in heaven. And the message here is the angels in heaven neither marry or are given in marriage just like you will be when you're there with me in heaven. There will be no marriage between a man and a woman in heaven. Marriage is an earthly, God-given institution. But it's not going with us. So the holy angels of God neither marry or are given in marriage. We know angels appeared in human form. Think about it. We know that the Bible says we entertain angels unawares. Well, how is that unless uh, they're visible? Still this day, remember Mr. Spaghetti, Spaghetti Man that I told you about four years ago? That I still to this day wondered if he, and still wonder, if he was an angel. Came in, I was, at a, I was at a low point as a young preacher. I was low, man, I was low. I was scraping the bottom of the barrel and just praying God would see me through it. Hard times, hard times. And up walked this burly chested man. And we were having a little dinner or something that night and he offered to make spaghetti. And normally I'd say, you crazy stranger going to poison my people? Get out of here. Get my gun. Get you out of here. Get the hints. Right? I didn't. And he stayed and he went to the store and he bought and he provided and he nurtured and he encouraged me. Never heard of him. Never saw him before or since. Still to this day, I wonder, Mr. Spaghetti Man, were you an angel? Could have well been. 
could have well been. Demons can enter human bodies. We know that from Scripture. And what was born, by the way, of this human, this, this union, was human. Was human. Because that's the condemnation, that's the warning as to humankind. Not to some alien creature from outer space. But human. They were great human beings in the sense that they were men of renown. Impressive lot. Another game that Satan plays. But the warning of, against apostasy is to the men, not to the fallen angels. It's to the men. God did not repent of creating angels. But the Bible does say it repented God and made man. So let's not lose sight. Again, they were always looking for a way to pass the buck. And if they could pass the buck for evil, the prevalence of evil in humanity, they would pass the buck. Adam tried it, Eve tried it, and they tried it again and again and again, and they tried it with angels. Even had lineages, great lineages of angels that they kept, and it's the angels' fault. It's the angels' fault. Now, as I said, Romans 1 has never been so applicable to our nation as it is today. Catch me there in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody has an excuse before God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and were in their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Fools. That's where we are today. What's going on here? Well, I tell you, in basic points of this, they're downgrading God. And elevating man. They're downgrading God. Pull God down. And let's lift up man. It's almost like years ago. You know when the, in the public school. Here comes the group. Up. Up with people. With people wherever you go. And now we have religion teaching us. Not only humanism. But religion teaching us. Up. Up with who? God? No. No. Make God a hip dude. Instead of the Almighty. But boy, we're going to lift up humanity. We're going to elevate. Elevate man. And pull down God. That's where the majority of people are today who name the name of Christ. They're not elevating God. They're not elevating His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be His name. But their own. And their own agendas come a long way, baby. Verse 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24. Pay attention now. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Lust. Drawn away of your own what? What's the Bible say? Drawn away of your own what? Lust. Drawn away of your own lust. And enticed. Through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. No virtue. You get it? No virtue. No honor. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Ye shall not surely die. Yea, hath God said. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. 
For this cause, you want to know why God does what he does? Here's the cause. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use, the normal sexual use, the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise the men. Leaving the natural use of the woman. Burned in their own lust toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. Unnatural. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. All right, that's what you want. You get it. But you're going to get my judgment too. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, dis disobedient to parents, without understanding, covetous, uh, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They're proud. They're proud of their perversion. They're proud of their perversion. Sound familiar? According to this text in Romans chapter 1, they went from lust. To a perverted sexual lust. They went from lust, wickedness, to a perverted sexual lust. And doing that which was unnatural. And, and proud of it. Proud of it. They had pride month all year long. All year long. Our nation, God help us, has gone from one generation, from the sexual revolution. What was that? Fornication. But fornication between men and women, young men and young women, Fornication. Our nation has gone from lust of the flesh in one generation. One generation in the Bible is either 40 or 50 years. In one generation, we've gone from lust to perversion and proud of it. In one generation. Just one. Just one. Obviously, the great signs of apostasy. Because it's one of the telltale signs is lust and perversion. Lust and perversion. I did some study about the Roman Empire. How many of you have ever studied the Roman Empire? It's hard for us to imagine the wickedness of the Roman Empire today. It's, it's really, it's just very difficult for us to imagine it coming from a background here in America. It's just really difficult. Men were to be great soldiers. They were to dominate on the battlefield. 
It's part of the, who they were, their national identity, is they were fighters and they had to be warriors on the battlefield and had to ex execute and be overpower everyone else and destroy everyone else in their path. What you may not know is they did the same thing sexually. And that's what's so difficult for us to understand. They would dominate and abuse their women. Women were not considered equals by any stretch of the imagination. And they were used and abused as toys. Then they did the same thing to other women. Not their wife, but other women. Not only that, but their slaves. I'm not going to go into everything that they did. I'm not doing it. I, I, I don't think it would be proper in the house of God. Much further than you can imagine what they would do. Even pre-puberty children doing the unthinkable to babies. And they were proud of it. They considered you're really not a man unless you are doing this. Matter of fact, if your wife committed a sexual act with another man, you could kill her. But before you killed her, you took the man that had her and you had him. I'm telling you, the unthinkable sexual perversion in a culture. Into that culture drove God's word. And those Christians took it downtown. And they paid a huge price for God's truth. That women were to be respected. They were to be loved. They were to be faithful to. They were to be considered as equals. And children were to be loved, not abused. Slaves, slaves were freed. Not abused. Not this debauchery. That's the apostasy of the Roman Empire into which Christianity drove their gospel train. And we want to cry about our circumstances. Bellyache about our circumstances. Well, I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm suffering. I can't really proclaim God's truth. I thank God. They did. They did. I want you to see this and feel this. Number one. God will judge the wicked. He will judge the wicked. And if you're one of the wicked, if you're not saved, and I mean you know that you know that you know you're saved. If you're not saved, your day's coming. Your day's coming. And you will suffer God's wrath. And hell will not be what you think it is with your buddies. And you say, oh, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a party. There'll be no parties in hell. Only eternal suffering and the gnashing, the grinding of teeth. Misery upon misery upon misery upon misery forever. You say, well, it hasn't happened. Well, in the old days, it didn't happen for how long? 1,650 years. God is merciful. He's patient. He's slow. He wants to bring repentance. And he still feels the same way today. 
You say, well, I've been doing this for the last 20 years. Stop it today. End it today. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Find grace in the eyes of the Lord today. Today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now choose whom you will serve. You have to choose. Because I'm not going to choose. You've already chosen. You've already chosen. And you've chosen very poorly. And you will pay in hell forever. But it's not necessary. It's not necessary. The second thing I want you to know is God, even in such a time as this, in time past, in such perversion, is what I've just scratched the surface on. Delivered his people during such a time as that. And if the point of the passages is, if God can preserve his own under such horrific circumstances, like in the days of Noah, or when the sons of God left their first estate and took the pretty women to wife and to have children. If God can preserve his children through all of that, he can preserve us yet today. He can save us. He can deliver us yet today. Chapter 2 of 2 Peter, verse 7, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelleth among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth, if he knows how to do that, listen, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. The Lord is not a novice. He's not incapable. He will punish the wicked. And he will deliver the godly out of temptation. Jude says the same thing. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let's stand. Lord of glory, if there's someone here today that doesn't know for sure that they're saved, Lord, I pray they would not let one verse go by before they make their way down this old-fashioned aisle and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Looking for the face of Almighty God to look and live for the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. Lord, those of us who are saved. And oftentimes, Lord, even right here in this sacred room, I've heard your people concern, concern, concern about your wonderful preservation for the saints. Help us to look back, read, learn, and know, and look to Christ and know that we have a great deliverer and God will provide. So let us not grow weary in well-doing. But push on for the cause and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ with virtue in our hearts and purity before God. Knowing that the Lord will return very soon. Perhaps even today. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. We'll sing page 551 as our hymn of invitation. Near to the heart of God, page 551. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God, all Jesus blessed Sweet.
feet near to the heart of God, a place where we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. to present to you today for church membership uh, Kristen McCollum and Terry Chastain of course that's brother Chastain's uh, daughter and they'd like to unite uh, here and I'm just going to say from First Baptist Church of Wiley, Texas alright, do I have a motion to receive them to the church family state of motion second, all in favor say amen, amen. alright, in just a minute we'll have an opportunity for you to come by and give them the right hand of Christian fellowship and welcome them and to the family of New Heights uh, Baptist Church. Uh, right now, I'd like for you to give a notice, if you would, Brother Colt will kind of follow up me up on this and dismiss us in prayer. But we have coming up our family camp. And out there in the foyer, you'll see these little yellow flyers. And we want you to be involved in this. We want you to be involved in this, not only you personally, but we want you to be involved by inviting your friends and neighbors to come and be a part of this. Be a part of the family camp of New Heights Baptist Church. All right? So you can take some of these flyers and you can pass it out to uh, families, young families that have children uh, in your neighborhood or go down to your, your local park. And this is going to be outdoors. It's going to be in a park. We're going to start on a Wednesday night. And we're going to go through a Saturday. It's going to be a great time. And the gospel of Jesus Christ will be presented. All right? If we want to do God's work, we have to do the work. So I'm asking you to help us. Brother Colt, finish that up. Have everybody stand. Pray. Dismiss us, send them home to eat biscuit and blanket. Okay, no, not yet. Have a seat, have a seat. I know there was a lot of information right there, but hopefully I'll get it all right. Okay, so family camp, I just want to follow up with uh, just really fast. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. On the left side, I believe it's the left side, there's sign-ups for snacks and stuff like that. Every night we're going to have popsicles or ice cream, watermelon, things of that nature. Um, and y'all can sign up in order to bring that, just bring that to the church, and then we'll take it out there and... You know, y'all can be involved that way. Uh, for the most part, as far as like the preaching and, and games and stuff like that, uh, myself, Brother Joe, and uh, Brother Colin and Brother Luke will be handling most of the work. Um, the biggest thing that we need help with is uh, serving up the snacks at the, uh, which is going to be at the end of uh, the uh, the meeting time there, and. Uh, and then the games. We're going to have some little carnival games as well as family group games. So if you would sign up out in the foyer for that. Um, I did want to say who this is for because I had a couple people ask me. I've had a few phone calls, people saying that they're going to come. This is for our families. Okay, so as a family group, okay, so the family is going to be, we're going to have family games. So the people that I need to help sign up with to help with the games and serving and everything, we don't want. Okay, let's just say Brother Daniel, he was the one asking me. We don't want Brother Daniel to be helping serve. He's supposed to be involved with his family. Does this make sense to everybody? So if you can come out and help, that would be a huge blessing so that Brother Daniel can actually spend time with his family rather than him actually doing the serving. Makes sense. Okay, I just wanted to throw that out there. And we're going to have a meeting uh, right after the service, after we get through uh, shaking hands and everything up here, just to answer any questions, go through a little bit more details. But I just wanted to go with that. Uh, we also have 
Uh, master schedule is out there. Uh, make sure you grab that. There's vegetables and fruits and stuff in the kitchen. Grab those. There's a, a bunch of squash and stuff. And uh, I think that is it for the announcements. Oh, tubing trip. Yes, tubing trip. We're also going to have a meeting for that after the evening service tonight. So there's all the announcements. Now we can stand. I think I got everything. Yes. All right. Now let's be dismissed in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for being here in your house this morning. Thank you for the word preached. Lord, help us to just draw near to you and have that relationship with you because the world that we live in today is a wicked place and we are wicked people. Lord, we are not deserving of your grace, of your mercy. Lord, we need you in order for, uh, to help us stand and be a shining light to our community and to our country and to the world. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord, though we are undeserving. We pray for those who are unable to be here, those that are sick or are traveling. Uh, just be with them. Keep them safe. We thank you for the additions to our church family uh, this very day, Lord. Bless us as we go uh, about our lives this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.